Well, this morning, I've already read the text that we're going to be looking at primarily. The verse I would like to read for you right now is 2 Corinthians 11.3, where Paul is warning the Corinthians that the devil does not do to them what he did to Eve. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, let me just read this one verse. He says, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, your minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. And again, here we see the devil's main tactic, his main strategy against us, which is to try to lead us away from our devotion to the Lord Jesus. Uh, and he does that primarily by working through the word to try to undermine the Lord's truth. So that's what we're going to be looking at um, this morning. But what I'd like to do is begin with an illustration, something that, that I heard this week that kind of struck me, which I had heard before, perhaps I've mentioned before, but I thought would be encouraging uh, to, to each of us as far as what is possible if we will fight this battle and we will use what the Lord has given to us to grow in Him. Um, it's really an example from uh, the life of, of Jonathan Edwards. Okay? Now, when Jonathan Edwards was 20 years old, he had already graduated from, from Yale uh, College, uh, which wasn't unusual in those days. As a matter of fact, he started when he was about 13 years of age. But he graduated with a bachelor's, and then he went two more years and got his uh, master's, and that's basically what you would do if you were preparing for the ministry in those days. And then he went, when he was 19 years old, to a church in New York, a Presbyterian church, and he pastored it for eight months, and after that returned to become a tutor at, at Yale. Now, while he was there at Yale College again, uh, a 13-year-old girl caught his eye. And we might think that's kind of strange. By this time, he's 20, she's 13. But remember, young ladies uh, matured and married quite a bit earlier in those days. But her name was Sarah Pierpont. Now, the thing that's interesting here is the reason why this girl caught his eye, and it wasn't necessarily because of her beauty, but rather it was because of her character. This is what he wrote about her in the front of his uh, Greek grammar. He wrote actually quite a bit. Quote, they say there is a young lady in New Haven, that's where Yale College is, who is beloved of that almighty being who made and rules the world. And that there are certain seasons in which this great being, in some way or other invisible, comes to her and fills her mind with exceeding sweet delight. And that she hardly cares for anything except to meditate on him. That she expects after a while to be received up where he is. To be raised up out of the world and caught up into heaven. Being assured that he loves her too well to let her remain at a distance from him always. There she is to dwell with him and to be ravished with his love and delight forever. Therefore, if you present all the world before her with the richest of its treasures, she disregards it and cares not for it and is unmindful of any pain or affliction. She has a strange sweetness in her mind and singular purity in her affections, is most just and conscientious in all her actions, and you could not persuade her to do anything wrong or sinful if you would give her all the world, lest she should offend this great being. She is of a wonderful sweetness, calmness, and universal benevolence of mind, especially after those seasons in which this great God has manifested himself to her mind. She will sometimes go about from place to place singing sweetly and seems to be always of joy and pleasure and no one knows for what. She loves to be alone and to wander in the fields and on the mountains and seems to have someone invisible always conversing with her. Now, Jonathan and Sarah married four years later, and Jonathan Edwards would remark that her spiritual relationship and her devotion to God would continue to be an inspiration to him throughout his entire life. 
Now, let me just pause for a moment and mention one thing I think is quite obvious. Those of you who are single here this morning, this is really what you ought to be looking for in a spouse. Not just a beautiful face, but a beautiful heart. One that is devoted to God. And this is also what you ought to be working towards in your own life. Now, the same, of course, applies to those of us who are married. This is what we should all be seeking after, this kind of character, this kind of communion with God. Now, for us to move ahead this morning on this particular topic, I think we do need to agree on this particular point that Sarah and what she experienced was really what we ought to be seeking, that she was moving in the right direction, that she wasn't an example of somebody who was so heavenly-minded that she was no, of no earthly good. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever read of anyone more heavenly-minded than her, and yet one that was used by the Lord in the way that she was. She was very useful because of her heavenly-mindedness. See, if we don't see that this is really what the Lord desires of us, we really don't understand who Jesus is because this is what he was like. His image was being formed in her. This is really what our Lord is calling us to be. And this is the kind of fellowship he wants to have with us. Now, the question is, do you want to have this kind of fellowship with the Lord? Do you want to have a communion with him that is so satisfying that you really don't desire anything else? Now, you do have that desire if you're a believer here this morning because that is what the Spirit of God actually works in our hearts. But this is the point that we need to see, that this kind of relationship does not happen automatically. There is something that we need to do in order to obtain it. Now, the question is, what is it that we need to do? I mean, how is it that Sarah developed this kind of character at only 13 years of age? I mean, look at the average 13-year-old today and then consider what I just read. There's quite a difference between them. How did Sarah become like this? Now, maybe we think that this is the way she was born. You know, maybe... It was a, an act of uh, God's grace and mercy, or perhaps um, she just didn't you know, become corrupted like the rest of the world does after they are born into this world. Well, if we think that there was something immaculate about her, we're wrong. She came into the world the same way that we do, the same way that everyone does, and that is in sin. Paul writes in Romans 5.18, through one transgression, that is that act of Adam that we read about this morning through the fall, there resulted condemnation to all men. And we know that that sin of Adam was imputed to us, it was credited to us because he was our representative. And so Paul says in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. When David is, is expressing why he fell with Bathsheba and had Uriah, her husband, murdered, he said, I was conceived in sin. In iniquity, I was brought forth. And he wasn't talking just about himself. He was talking about all mankind. So she was no exception. Well, maybe it was because she had a better upbringing. And certainly that is an advantage. She was the daughter of James Pierpont, who was the very godly pastor of the New Haven Church. Now, certainly her upbringing had a lot to do with it. It's a great blessing to be raised by believing parents in the truth. But just look around and look at, for examples in the Bible, for instance. How many children have been raised by godly parents in households like this only to end up denying the faith? And how many are there who weren't raised in Christian households and yet the Lord had mercy on them and powerfully use them. You see, it's not just the formula on how to produce a godly child. It's important, but it's not the determining factor. Now, maybe it was her ancestral heritage. She was the great granddaughter of Thomas Hooker, the great Puritan pastor, leader, and founder of the state of Connecticut. The Lord does tell us that he blesses the descendants of those who love and obey him to a thousand generations. But we do need to come to grips with the fact that does not necessarily mean that all of the descendants of those who love and serve him are going to love and serve him all the way down the line. Remember, Abraham was the friend of God. 
God made his covenant of circumcision with him and said he would be a God to him and to his seed after him. Well, Isaac believed, but Ishmael did not. Several years down the road, the sins of his children, the nation of Israel, was because of their sins, they were swept out of the land into exile. They were thrown out. The land vomited them out, as it were. And it was also his descendants that rejected and crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that all of our descendants are obviously going to be saved, because if that were true, then the whole world would be saved. Because Adam and Eve, I believe, were redeemed by God, and we are their children. Everyone is from them. And of course, we have to also bear in mind how many are those that the Lord has saved and used that, he, that really didn't come from any godly background, to have no godly ancestors in their past. So we need to get away from the idea that Sarah somehow was unique, and we need to come down to what it was that really distinguished her. There are two main reasons why Sarah had this close relationship with the Lord. Well, the first was, obviously, that the Lord had mercy on her that he gave her his Holy Spirit. He raised her to life so that she could trust in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and be saved. But again, how many are there the Lord saves who never approach this level of spirituality? The second is the important thing for those who are believers, and that is that she did what the Lord calls us to do. She fought against her enemies. And by God's grace, she overcame them. Now again, the fact that there was nothing unique about her means that she's a good example to us of what it is that we can experience in our relationship with the Lord if we're only willing to fight the same spiritual battle. Now it's important that we do because when we're in a state like this, we are much more useful to the Lord. Last week, we saw that there is a day coming, I've already mentioned it again this morning, in which we will all stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and give an account for our lives. If we haven't trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord tells us that on that day, every single sin that we've ever committed will be brought up against us and will be weighed in the balances. Even every idle word that we've spoken, every sinful thought, every sinful desire, as well as every sinful action, and we will be judged accordingly. But we also saw that if we have trusted Jesus, we will not be judged for our sins because Jesus has already been judged for them. Instead, we will be rewarded for the things that we have done for him. But we also saw that if we are to receive a reward, we have to have done something that is rewardable. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there are going to be some who have a great reward, who have built with gold and silver and precious stones because they spend more of their time, more of their energy, more of their resources in serving the Lord, serving. That, that's the key. You know, all, all we do here is essentially we are worshiping the Lord, that is serving Him. But this is mainly preparation to do what the Lord actually calls us to do. And it's in that serving that we are storing up riches and treasures in heaven. But Paul also reminded us that there will be some there who served him very little, and so will receive little or nothing, wood, hay, and stubble, which will burn up in the fire. So the question we asked was this, how can we receive a greater reward? How can we do more for the Lord? Well, the answer is we have to become more like Jesus. Like Sarah Pierpont Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, Paul the Apostle, George Whitfield, C.H. Spurgeon, we have to become more like the Lord because that is what makes us useful. But the only way we can do this is through spiritual warfare. There is, as we mentioned earlier, a very powerful being called the devil who hates us and is trying to stop us. And he knows how to use the world very effectively against us. And he knows our weaknesses. He knows that we can be tempted because we have sin in our souls. And he knows exactly what it is that will tempt us. He is the master fisherman. If we are to gain a greater reward, we have to be able to overcome these enemies so that we might become more like Jesus, 
so that we might be able to serve him more. That, you see, this is the secret, as it were, of fruitfulness and usefulness and greater reward in everything that a Christian desires. It's the hard work of sanctification, of becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ, but that requires, as I said, hard work. It requires that we do battle with the enemy because he is doing everything he can to neutralize us. Now, this morning, I want us to consider one of the main ways that the devil works against us. It isn't through his great strength. He doesn't attack us, subdue us, wrestle us to the ground. Now, Satan is very strong. His angels are very strong. We read in the Bible that the Lord sent one of his holy angels against the armies of Assyria. And in one night, one angel killed 186,000 Assyrians by himself. I'm sure he could have wiped out the entire world. Now, if angels are that powerful, how easily could Satan overcome us? But that is not what the Lord allows him to do. He won't let him destroy us. So the devil doesn't work in that way. Well, since he isn't allowed to fight that way, he goes about it a different way. He uses his craftiness. He uses deception. Now, we read last week in Ezekiel that Satan was once a great angel, perhaps the greatest created being that God had made. And when he was in that state, he was full of godly wisdom. We read in Ezekiel 28, verse 12, you had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. He was full of wisdom. But now that he's fallen, his wisdom has become corrupted. We read in verse 17 of that same chapter in Ezekiel, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. And now the devil uses this wisdom to deceive. Jesus said to the leaders in Jerusalem, the Jewish leaders, when they refused to listen to him, to the truth that he was speaking to them, he says this in John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil. And you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. This is the devil's main tactic. He uses lies. He uses deception. Now, perhaps you've heard the phrase, the pen is mightier than the sword. Words are more powerful than military force. Consider how the book, The Communist Manifesto, written by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, consider what kind of damage that has done in this world. Now, Satan knows that that is the case. He knows that's true, which is why this is his main weapon, words, deceiving words, because they are so powerful. Now, that's why we need to be careful what we listen to, what we read, what we say because of the power of words. Uh, this was actually already referred to this morning in our prayer meeting where James writes in James 3, 5, so also the tongue is a small part of the body and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. Again, words are very powerful. That's why Satan uses words. Now, Satan also uses something else. He, he cloaks himself, as we've already seen this morning. If we know the one talking to us wants to destroy us, we're going to be more reluctant to listen to him. But if we think that he actually intends our good, then we will listen. And that's why the devil deceives us in this way. It includes a cloak or a veneer of godliness Remember what Paul wrote to the Corinthians in our meditation in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14. For even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. That's the reason why the Corinthians were listening to his messengers, because they thought they were trying to do them some good. Satan is very good at what he does. Now, our passage this morning gives us a very good example of how he works in his deception or his temptation of Eve. 
Now, when he approached Eve, notice the first thing that he did, and perhaps if you want to follow along, we're, we're now in Genesis 3, okay? The first thing he did was call God's word into question. We read in verse 1, Now, the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Did God really say that? Is that what he really meant? Okay, so he's calling into question the word of God. Now, the Bible actually is very clear in what it says. There are some things in here that are hard to understand. We all under accept that. But the things that we are to believe in order to be saved and the way God wants us to live is actually quite clear. And yet, how often have we struggled to grasp even simple things in the Word of God? Have you ever wondered why that is? Why you've had a hard time understanding something the Bible says? I, I you know, throughout my life, I've studied a number of subjects but studying the Bible has been one of the most difficult of those things, even though I wanted to study it uh, perhaps more than anything else. The reason is because there's spiritual warfare going on when you come to the Word of God. There are things trying to stop you, trying to help keep you from understanding or accepting what it is that God says. Why has it been difficult? Why do we have a difficult time taking what the Word of God says seriously? Well, it's because of spiritual warfare, because of the enemies that are coming against us. Now, it's not always because of Satan's personal influence. If we think that he's always personally attacking us, that may be a matter of pride. I mean, are we really that important? Satan can only be in one place at one time. But he does have many demons. Plus, we have an inborn, inbred, uh, resident enemy that is still with us wherever we go, which is the flesh, the sin in our hearts. And as I said earlier, it is trying to do to us the same thing the devil is trying to do to us. It wants to destroy us. So we have these things coming against us to keep us from understanding the clear, you know, the clear word of God and making us doubt that we have the right understanding. Now, Satan knew what the truth was. I mean, the fact that he asked this question shows that he knew what God said and he also knew what God meant by what he said because he was trying to make Eve doubt that. He was trying to weaken Eve's conviction of the truth. So that's one of the things the devil does. Now, the second thing he did was he tried to change the meaning of what the Lord actually said in this temptation. Again, in verse 1, Indeed, has God said... You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Now, Satan, again, knew exactly what the Lord had said. He knew it was just the one tree and not the many trees. He knew what, that, what the terms were. So what he's doing here, perhaps, is calling into question maybe the goodness of God. Would God have made all these wonderful trees with all their delicious fruit? And by the way, these fruit trees, we have to believe, are the trees from which you know, we have our fruit today and so forth, and we know how good that fruit can be. I mean, we, we've been recently enjoying the peaches off of the Dozelle's trees. Would God have made this beautiful trees, all these beautiful trees and all this beautiful fruit, only to tell you you can look at them, but don't touch them. You can't eat from these trees. Well, that, that would be cruel. God is cruel. How can God do that and be good? So maybe that's what the devil was doing, or perhaps he was confusing the issue. And he was trying to blend the tree they shouldn't eat of with all the other trees, knowing that, that Eve knew that God had given her permission to eat of those trees. He was just trying to minimize the fact that, well, if he's given you all these trees, why not this tree as well? Now, again, how many times have we tried to sort out whether something was right or wrong? And then we have all these ideas flooding into our minds, confusing the issues, all these various counter-arguments, and we have a hard time seeing what the truth is. Again, God's word is really not that complicated. It's just that our enemies are trying to deceive us. Now, Eve knew what the Lord had said, and Satan had not yet succeeded in derailing her because she defends what the Lord says in verses 2 and 3. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. 
But from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Now, I know a lot's been made of this phrase, touch it. You know, did God say that? Did they just add that? It's really not clear whether that part came from God or whether Adam and Eve essentially imposed that on themselves so that they wouldn't be tempted into disobeying the Lord. You know, if God says that we shouldn't do something, we need to make sure we don't flirt with that thing. We need to make sure we stay away from that thing and not get as close as we can to it. So perhaps Adam and Eve put some sort of offense in their minds around the tree, I'm not even going to touch it. Or the Lord could have said, don't touch it. Don't touch that fruit. So we don't know, but Eve knew that God had given them free reign to eat of all the trees in the garden. So thirdly, having interjected doubt into the commandment itself, Satan then calls the penalty into question. The serpent said to the woman in verse 4, you surely will not die. God is not going to kill you for eating from that tree. It's really not that serious. God is far too gracious. God is far too loving. He will forgive you. He will not carry out his threat. Now, how many people today are banking on exactly that point, that God is not going to carry out his threat He's not going to condemn those that continue in their sins, that refuse to trust in his son, that continue on in their evil ways. Why do they believe that? Well, it's because of spiritual warfare. It's because of the enemy's deception. It's because of their flesh. Doesn't want them to be saved. It wants to destroy them. Now, we need to make sure that we don't make the same mistake, that we don't doubt that God means exactly what he says. Now, he did love Adam and Eve, but he told them, if you eat from this tree. You are going to die. And they ate and they died. Okay? God means what he says. And to think otherwise means that the devil has deceived us. Now finally, he again calls God's goodness into question. Verse 5. You surely will not die for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Satan is tempting them, of course, as we saw with R.C. Sproul on a couple Wednesday nights ago, to exercise their own self-will, to be autonomous, to be self-governed, and to do what they think is right. But something else I think is going on here as well, and that is there's this good thing that you could gain if you would just eat of this tree, and God is trying to keep you back from it. The reason why God doesn't want you to eat of this fruit is because he knows it's good for you. It will make you more like him. You will have a knowledge that only he possesses. Now, again, has it ever seemed to you that God's commandments were perhaps restricting you from something that might otherwise be good? You know, something that might help you, something that might give you more pleasure. Why does God tell me I can't do this? I don't see what the problem is. Well, again, the reason is because of spiritual Warfare. Satan doesn't want you to see the bitterness of that fruit of eating and going that direction. Well, notice how the the devil's deception succeeded. We read in verse 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, And that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Now, notice what happened. When Satan first came to her, she said, we can't eat of this tree. If we do, we're going to die. And now, she's not looking at the tree that way at all any longer. She now wanted to do what God clearly had told her not to do, and she followed through. She did it. She ate from the tree and so did Adam. She was no longer looking at what God said and at what God threatened. But now she was looking at the tree as though it was good. It was good for food. Beautiful, beautiful tree, beautiful fruit. And how beneficial it would be for her to eat from that tree. In other words, she no longer saw things the way she should see them. And so she disobeyed God and she fell. 
Now, let me point out what I think is obvious. Just about every time we do something that we know God tells us not to do, somehow we have convinced ourselves, or we think we've convinced ourselves as the enemy in our flesh, that it's better that we actually do that thing than obey God and not do that thing. But let me just remind you of something else you know. Each time we make that choice, we're wrong, okay? Satan and our flesh have deceived us, and each time we go down that wrong path, we eventually learn that we're wrong, and we also learn the consequences of making that choice. And it's perhaps not as severe as it was for Adam and Eve, though it would be apart from God's grace, but when we sin against God and choose against Him and we do what He tells us not to do or even when we don't do what He tells us to do, we break our communion with God. We don't break it entirely, thankfully. We're still united to Jesus Christ, but we lose fellowship. We grieve the Holy Spirit and to some degree we are alienated from Him. Again, read Psalm 50 where David says, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The Spirit is withdrawn. He senses that distance from God. He knows that he is in some sense alienated from God. He's experiencing not what Sarah Pierpont Edwards experienced, but he's experiencing perhaps something closer to what we might normally experience, and that is distance from the Lord. Now, this is the reason why we're not as close to God as we might otherwise be. And why we don't have the relationship with him that Sarah Pierpont, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon, George Muller, not the Muller who's doing the investigation, but the one who took care of the orphans, and others enjoyed. You see, if we want that kind of relationship, we have to recognize the enemy's tactics. We need to listen to God rather than to him. We need to fight against the enemy. Now, I've just opened up the subject this morning. This evening, we're going to consider what it is we need to do against the enemy. How do we repel him? How do we recognize his deception? And how do we avoid his snares? Well, we're going to look at how Jesus did because he's the perfect example of how we are to do battle with the enemy and overcome. Jesus is our example in every area. We need to see how he lived. We need to see what he did. And we need to follow it, and we can, by the power of his Holy Spirit. Jesus is the embodiment of obedience to the Word of God. So we need to follow him. And let me just remind you, as we would um, prepare to come to the table, that Jesus, in his work, in his obedience, and in giving us this example, he obeyed perfectly. And he died on the cross in order to crush the head of the serpent and to free us from his dominion, and to give us power to resist him and overcome him. Jesus has done it all. We can't do it in our own strength. We need his power, his strength, and he has provided it. Now, it's not in the table. The table is just reminding us that Jesus has done it. But the table is, is here, again, to lift up our eyes to heaven, that we might commune with Jesus, that we might know that he's gained the victory for us, and that we might also be strengthened by his Holy Spirit in our souls so that we will be able to overcome the enemy. So let's, let's bow and let's ask the Lord to, to um, not only to apply what we've just heard, that we need to be on the lookout for this enemy and to know how he's working against us, but let's also prepare to come to the table to remember that we can overcome the enemy because Jesus has already done warfare with him and defeated him.